Hello. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. This is going to invite a few people up on the stage. And then we'll begin this one. Can you guys try and unmute yourself? See if that works. Yes, hi. It's Graham. Awesome. It was lovely hearing you. Uh, I guess we can kick this one off and I'll just add speakers as we go. Uh, Cody, would you like to kick this one off? Uh, what we are going to talk about, and of course, uh, we are also going to talk a bit more about X talks as well. So, would you like to begin? For sure. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for joining uh, today's episode number thirty-nine of X Talks. Uh, we've got a pretty good topic. Uh, uh, for today, uh, addressing uh, open source tech IP um, and the benefits and challenges of uh, taking your code uh, open source. So um, we've got a pretty good amount of uh, panelists up here that uh, will definitely weigh in on today's subject. So uh, before we begin, uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and please uh, re-share uh, this link to this episode so that we can get more people in, out there. Um, likewise, uh, be sure to follow a lot of the um, uh, panelists that we have uh, speaking today. Um, they've taken time out of their day to uh, join us in this conversation, so please reward them with the follow. They definitely deserve it. So. Um, Without, with that being said, let's uh, let's kind of dive in today's topic uh, a, a little bit. Uh, before we do, let's let's kind of give a little quick intro. Um, my name is Cody. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at Layer One X. Um, we are a, a sponsored by Layer One uh, Blockchain. Layer One is a fully decentralized blockchain that specializes in bridgeless interoperability. And uh, as a result of that, we we're able to do some pretty, pretty fantastic stuff and have already been able to help quite a few different uh, projects in the process of uh, going multi-chain. So um, our main ethos is, is that we want to unite all of the chains, uh, projects and users across the uh, Web3 so that we can... Um, uh, basically start building that kind of utopia that we're all looking for, uh, which is a united utopia Web3 experience. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's kind of uh, take a few few uh, minutes and allow our, our panelists to speak and uh, kind of uh, give their 30-second elevator pitch. And so let's start with... Uh, uh, let's see here. Who's first on my list? Liana. Hi, everyone. My name is Lena Grunhofer. Uh, I've been building in Web3 since 2020. Um, I've had the privilege of working for a bunch of different brands, more so recently the Solana Foundation. Um, in the past, I've worked ga Game 7, NFL Rivals, and so forth under my marketing agency, um, Zeitgeist Labs, and more so recently, I'm building Solana's New York City community called Offline. So really excited to be here. Thank you for having me for another talk, Lairon. 
Yes, uh, welcome back. Um, uh, let's see here. We have uh, uh, Blue Collar. Do you want to go next? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on another Layer 1 uh, X space. I always love the the spaces and panels you guys put together. But my name is Travis. Uh, I am uh, BD and communications for Vaynar Blockchain. We are an L1 blockchain that's currently in testnet. We'll be launching our mainnet here this month. Uh, we've got some campaigns going on on Galaxy, Velocity, and a few other places. Uh, Vaynar is uh, an L1 focused on the entertainment and, and uh, multimedia sector uh, mainly. However, we do have uh, um, a lot of different brands and projects and stuff with RWA, AI, and some other uh, features that that have uh, onboarded onto the chain recently. So very excited to dig into this talk and uh, talk, talk about open source uh, benefits, pros, and cons. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, Kevin, you want to go next? I would love to. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Yunai. I'm the founder of a project called RWA.inc. We are a real-world asset tokenization and investment ecosystem, and we are soon laun launching our uh, token on uh, various central exchanges and launch pads. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Perfect. Uh, Grammy? Amelbot, I, yeah, I think you changed um, your handle title since the last time I saw you. Well, it doesn't, it still doesn't help. I've now even put my name and it still does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll get, I'll, I'll find one eventually that's really easy for the uh, host to understand, right? Um, but I'm, this is my third attempt and I thought I'll, I'll just give you my name now. Uh, rather than some acronym. Or, um, anyway, yes, I'll continue. So I'm an anti-money laundering advisor at AMLBot, um, and I also co-chair with the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. Uh, at AMLBot, we provide KYC, KYT software and crypto investigation services, which is essentially to support law enforcement investigations uh, and to help financial institutions and essentially cryptocurrency businesses to mitigate financial crime risks within the digital market. So... One of the things we can offer is if someone wants to do a quick pre-check, um, they can just do an address check. They don't have to buy subscription or contracts. Um, we can just do them sort of ad hoc um, and to get a risk score effectively. So I won't go too much into that, but that's effectively what we are. We're a quick to use, easy to use system. And um, that'll do for me for now. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, well, welcome. Um, yeah, I'm also joined by uh, Sam, who's on our uh, L1X handle, uh, who is my co-host. And then we're also joined by uh, Inna, who is uh, our X Talks resident badass and puts everything together for us. And so I'll, I'll let her introduce herself as well. She's the, Hi. by the way, she's the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, sorry to jump in, but yeah, that's what we call her. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you can hear your Swiss Army knife tonight because I'm experiencing like real troubles tonight with the uh, Twitter. But um, yeah, please confirm you can hear me. I'm not talking Hi. to you all. Okay, cool. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lovely. Uh, well, yeah, on behalf of Layer 1X and also X Talks uh, specifically, I'd like to thank everyone who ever steps, uh, stepped in or will step in into our spaces. Really appreciate you all. Um, these spaces were created to unite us, to um, explore um, existing and new projects and protocols and give everybody a chance to step in and expose themselves uh, we're growing quite quite fast, and um, it's fascinating every time we meet someone new, or uh, we uh, have people who already are our regulars. Every time, it's an amazing space. So I thank you for everything, and uh, yeah, I'm passing on the mic on to Cody, who's going to lead this conversation. Frankly speaking, this is one of my favorite topics because I think it's very. Um, controversial right you never know what's best go go out there publicly or keep your privacy and you know remain exclusive it's an interesting dilemma i would say so yeah let's let's go into it thank you guys
Yeah, and uh, just a reminder before Cody does a deep dive into this rabbit hole, uh, I just want to let you all know that you can use the comment section if you have any sort of questions for us or the panelists or speakers. Or if you would like to jump up on the stage, just simply raise your hand or request the mic and uh, I'll let you up on the stage. Passing over to you, Cody. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so let's just kind of set the stage for this. Um, you know, uh, it, as Ines mentioned, this is a pretty interesting topic. Um, and so with that being said, you know, Wall Street definitely runs on secrets. Silicon Valley runs on patents. Crypto runs on code for all to see. But does open source really mean true transparency? Can you own an idea that everyone can fork? Is your investment safe when it comes to uh, rules that are and, and things that are constantly up for grabs? And so that's one thing that we definitely want to dive in today is on the benefits, the battles, and the deep philosophy uh, behind the uh, going open source with your crypto code, especially for projects. So with that being said, let's... Uh, hi, hi, everyone. I apologize. I think I was on. invited too, but I was not introduced. Uh, so does it make sense for me to do that? Heck yeah, Absolutely. go for it. Go for it, go Great. for it. Great. Uh, and apologies for my proactiveness with this, but my name is Ian Arden. I am a developer turned venture builder turned VC. Uh, so happy to talk about this topic. I run a fund uh, registered in Cayman Islands called Mempool Ventures, but the way the way I got into uh, into fund management is definitely through like the technology. Uh, I have built a lot of code myself. Some of the companies I touched were sold to uh, large enterprises for like dozens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, happy to contribute to this conversation. Thanks. Great. Well, welcome. Um, we appreciate you being here. So the first question, let's kick this off. Uh, with many developers now entering crypto from traditional tech, how does their experience with open source and Web 2 differ from what they may encounter in Web 3, specifically within DeFi and uh, native blockchain source code? Feel free to jump in. Uh, yeah, I'd love to start because uh, I touched both. And I can say one thing that the Web 3 open source uh, because code is law and whatever is uh, in, in the code, if there is vulnerability, it will be taken advantage of. Uh, this means Web3 uh, open source is, is much more polished out and uh, um, tested. Uh, the security audits are there. So the quality is uh, definitely like much higher than in the Web2. The Web2 strategy usually presumes um, that there is like open source for the for the free and private usage but if you want real quality and support you will go uh, and turn into the enterprise uh, subscription client and then you will pay for it and you will get some extra features and stuff and web3 you you kind of have everything out there right away End of message. <laughs> yeah, no, those are some great points. Uh, anybody else want to add into that? Guys, literally feel free to jump in. Over. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy. There, are, there aren't any cues or stuff like that. Just jump in. Plus, I can't see hands, so. I am not personally a dev, so I, I don't have a lot of insight into this question, particularly as far as, uh, you know, kind of the differences between Web 2 and Web 3 um, in that angle. But um, with, with Web 3, you know, I, I'd say that a lot of times, especially with, with um, a lot of stuff pertaining or around Web 3, um, you're dealing with a lot of uh money or liquidity um in various ways where i feel like you know some of the web 2 open source code is not necessarily tokens or you know some type of smart contract or something that can be exploited for financial uh gains quite as easy um 
but but web3 you definitely have to be a lot more careful because um you know a lot of the, the stuff that we're doing in the space uh, whether it's from a blockchain layer a dap layer or or anything else um, usually has a lot of opportunity for exploit financially um, and and to uh, really take advantage of people, drain contracts, drain liquidity pools, drain wallets, you know, route route transactions differently, things of that sort. So, um, you know, I, I think open source has a lot of uh, pros to it because the more eyeballs you have on code, you can always have your code audited. Uh, but even the auditors can miss something, and we see it all the time in various bridge hacks or different hacks that that had audits or even multiple audits at times, and there's still these vulnerabilities. When you open source your code, you can put a lot more eyeballs on it um, to to find some of those uh, you know lesser known or or lesser found kind of exploits in that way. But also to Ian's point, it can also be exploited, you know, by by the black hat hackers as well. Um, in, in that regard, and as well, like as uh, mistakes could be populated. Hey, so like, um, it has so many angles to this. I generally wanted Cody to put up a little poll, um, for all our speakers and say like, who is um, you know, who is uh, for going. Um, public and who is uh, for staying exclusive but I suppose it's very hard to say it's not, there is no hard yes or hard no because there are so many variables to it yeah, and I think it can really depend on kind of what uh, you know the, the, the code is for or what your you know project or business is about uh, you know Personally, like things like wallets, I really like an open source wallet, not because I can read the code, but I trust that, you know, a, a popular wallet that's been open source, that code's been kind of gone through pretty well multiple times by, by many other people that know what they're looking at when they're, when they're looking at these things. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of uh, use case need and, and even reason um, to keep some of your code and, and things of the sort closed. Oh, I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Looks like we've got a new speaker on the panel, Olivia. Um, do you want to take a second and just kind of introduce yourself to the listeners? Or no? Or oh, okay. might want to <laughs> <laughs> might want to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm sure they must be using a bridge, and that is why it's sitting so long. Potentially, <laughs> potentially. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, Olivia, if you want, if you're having a hard time speaking, maybe drop out and drop back in. Um, that usually tends to help with the bugs that uh, uh, X Spaces have. So uh, we'll we'll come back to you. Um, yeah, um, Travis, I think you bring up a, a really good point there on a couple of different things. Um, just kind of as a follow-up question then, you know, uh, you, you mentioned some things need to be potentially open source versus other, you know, I, I feel like uh, crypto projects definitely need to protect their IP as much as area, uh, as much as possible. And, you know, within that, uh, when, when, you know, in Web3, when you do go fully open source, you do open yourself up to some of the IP gray area, we'll call it, um, where code is definitely reused um, without proper attribution or anything like that. And so how can Web3 projects protect themselves and um, or worse, uh, lose investor confidence as their valuable ideas are up for grabs um, in a decentralized de development process. Yeah, I, I think that's like kind of a tough uh, line you really got to walk. Um, you know, because like you said, you know, especially when you're first starting up, it it's so easy for someone to like come in, rip off your idea pump a bunch of KOLs, marketing, exposure, whatever else, and then suddenly, like, you're not known and someone else has taken your idea and your, you know, your your product, basically, um, has, has suddenly just kind of leached off what you were doing and, and gained that exposure. Uh, 
you know, I think even with decentralized protocols, you can keep stuff, you know, very closed, especially early on while you're, while you're building, while you're rolling out, uh, while you're kind of creating that product and experience. And f- from there, you know, I think a lot of the times, if you have a good product, you've got a good user experience, you've got a, a good business, and, and you actually, you know, um, care for your consumer and your consumer experience overall, you're going to have that natural leg up over someone that just comes in and rips your code and tries to do the same thing. Um, because creating something is great, but creating something that that's an enjoyable experience, that's functional, that works, and that, that people... Um, you know, kind of keep that goodwill towards it is completely different. Uh, you know, I can go rip off code from, uh, you know, if layer one X is, uh, code is all open source. I can go rip it all off and put out, you know, layer 1.1 X, uh, you know, chain everything, but I'm not going to have the same infrastructure, the same, um, you know, uh, as far as people infrastructure, as far as people, the same experience and, and really the same kind of vision and, and execution as, you know, layer one would have, um, I, I would assume that you guys will be doing that much better than than I could and, and kind of slapping it together. So, you know, it, I think it's kind of a tightrope act and you don't always want to, you know, open source it out too early. Um, but also, you know, I don't know if you really need to be that afraid of it once you've really got your feet on the ground. Um, there's always going to be competition. There's always going to be coming, someone coming along. But, you know, at the same time, you don't have to open source everything from your company um or or from you know if it's open source and a smart contract that's great it doesn't necessarily mean like you know the ux and ui is going to be the same or the interactions are going to be the same or anything else that that goes in front of that and really the user facing side of that product um but but yeah it's something that you know really from application to application and and, and product to product it's going to be very different some things you know are going to come out open source from the get-go out the gate uh, wide open and kind of be uh, more of a tool in that kind of sense, uh, where where some of these companies and stuff are going to be building maybe open source in small parts of their uh, business or product product or or open sourcing you know along the way uh, in, in various stages and steps. Yes, those are those are great points. Go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to give the mic to you. Anyway, thank you. I, I just want to say, I mean, from evaluation perspective i think still even though ip is important i think investors and vcs and more look more into like the cash flows the amount of holders and all you know all those matrices because everybody knows today with ai and all the movements going on that it's it's really becoming very very easy to code almost anything right also with the open source so IP, I think, in the future will be much less prioritized by investors. And I think concepts, traction, community engagement, that, that is the new oil, so to speak. So I don't think we should be too worried about that's the easy part. If you want to copy somebody, uh, I think what is hard to copy is the love from the community, the trust and the team and all that so that that's my view at least on it this is a very interesting very like um different point of view in my opinion again like um i always look at a source for instance as the whole idea behind the protocol and the project, the foundation of it, and then everything that is around it as if, you know, supporting products, community and, uh, you know, marketing and also investors and, and, you know, everything that goes with it. But you have a very interesting idea that... Is kind of like in my mind, right? It's a reversal, which is brilliant. Like I obviously, right. you know, it's just a great angle to look at. I mean, it's not like we we just throw out all our secret sauce out there and say just come and copy us. We of course protect everything we can, uh, but I'm just saying that it's it's not as you can say. It's not as dangerous as you think, because that's really, you could say, 
the easy part for people to imitate how your product works, I will assume. But they're, they're more, um, it's more difficult point of view and, 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 and that's my point actually. Speaking on behalf of Solana as a whole, um, I know that Super Team, which for those that don't know, is a group of developers um, based out of the East, um, came together to basically find bugs and so, so forth um, on Solana a few years back um, and, ha and have instead created bounties and accelerated project completion to help them um, really become the community-centric ecosystem. Now, I think open source as a whole has helped them, uh, you know, obviously expand their breadth of knowledge, obviously lean into bugs that weren't um, as beneficial for the ecosystem and so forth, and has since grown into this awesome um, global uh, team that has really just helped the crypt that crypto um, in particular thrive. So looking at the IP angle, I think there's a lot of power in magnitude in terms of people and breadth and width. And, you know, you're only, there's, I keep missing the quote, but it's like, you, um, it, I'm, I forgot what it was, but <laughs> essentially I think there's power numbers and the more that we can add people together, the better it goes. So. Yeah. Can I throw something in there? hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's really interesting what Kevin mentioned about this community because it's sort of like resonating through all of the people that are in the crypto space anyway, when they first got involved, the, the idea of this sort of decentralized community, and then you've got the good ad actors and the bad actors. So I think, yes, it's a great thought and I'm, and I'm very, um, would do anything to be part of that movement for, for the different parts of the world to communicate with each other uh, would be excellent. However, I need to put my compliance hat on because that's what I do. Um, so we really need to identify who these actors are in this space. So if we can't really got this community, but we don't know who they are. If, if we live in the same town, we can meet and we can talk, right? But if we're just uh, on the other end of another PC, then anything can happen and it does. But the open source part of me is interesting here, but the, the word that goes on the back end of that is intelligence. So we use open source intelligence um, for the transaction monitoring for two reasons. One, I think from an individual perspective, it's that there's a moral standpoint to it. And, but most importantly, I think if, if I speak to any operators, the most important reason they do it in the monitoring is because they're regulated and they need to keep the regulator happy. So they will want to avoid fines and all these things. So open source intelligence really helps to be able to, for compliance teams to be able to understand um, uh, how genuine uh, or any illicit action going on uh, with this. I think by going to the uh, addresses from the internet, first of all, there's lots of fuzzy matches, lots of incorrect data. So it needs a lot of work done to it to be able to get it to be um, evidence. You know, it's not a confirmation. It's just gaining evidence all the time. So you've got to build some confidence in that environment for the for a score to happen. So we've got a risk score that's uh, calculated and it's based on what, you know, what information does that come from? And this is just another spoke in the wheel that adds um, more security to a transaction and a risk score to say whether you should or shouldn't do it. Um, so the intelligence side of it can only help if a lot of information is going into it, if people are sharing these uh, risk factors and um, different things, because especially when we're looking at terrorist financing, it's crucial. Um, there's um, in the in the EU we have the six AMLD, which is very similar to FATF, where we have like there's 22 predicate offences, and if you pick up most of them that you see on the transaction monitoring and and uh, OSINT is very uh, uh, important in this area of gaining that extra information. You've done your KYC on someone, you've checked them out and KYB, et cetera. Um, and then you're looking at the transaction. But to get the OSINT information in as well really strengthens the case, um, especially when we're looking at terrorism, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, all of the big stuff. Theft and robbery and cybercrime sort of come together. So as, much, as many points that can come in there to give us an overall picture is really beneficial. So I'm, uh, you know, an advocate in open source intelligence. I think uh, it's it's in flux. It's always going to be moving. So the more identifications are going to be required all the time, and more evidence is going to be required all the time. And as this grows, because it's, you know, it's not going backwards. It's only going forward. Some say at a fast rate of knots. I don't quite agree. I think we're still having conversations we were having 
maybe 10 years ago, really. So, but, it, but it's, the ideas are certainly racing your head. And I, and I love that idea, what Kevin said, that, you know, for that to actually happen needs a lot of work, doesn't it? It needs a long way to go. Um, but for the actual outcome to be that would be um, certainly worth something investing into from a personal and business perspective. So I'll push the pause button there. <laughs> no, those are definitely some great, great insights. Uh, thanks for sharing that, especially from a compliance uh, point of view. Um, you know, uh, let's let's just pause there real quick before we jump into our next question. Um, uh, for those that are just listening in, my name is Cody. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at Layer 1X, and today we've got a pretty deep rabbit hole discussion going on regarding open source uh, tech, IP, um, and the benefits and challenges behind it. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and share this space uh, so that we can get this uh, topic out. It's a great one, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, likewise, uh, our panelists are working extremely hard to kind of answer these uh, uh, hard questions I'm throwing at them. So they definitely deserve a follow. So please, please go and follow them. Um, likewise, if you guys have any questions for our panelists, please be sure to drop those in the comments uh, section. And we'll get those up uh, to our panelists here a little bit later in this episode. So um Kind of, kind of going along the narrative of what we were just talking about with you know communities and um, being able to you know uh, tap into uh, a lot of eyeballs on the code to make it better. Um, we've talked about some some exploits that could happen as a potential of code going open source, um, and um, you know the need to not have all of the open source to be able to build on top of it, I, I think is a big one. But uh, let me come at it from a different angle. Um, you know, with with uh, some projects that are, are uh, kind of owned and operated, I guess you could say, uh, by DAOs, um, what, what are the unique challenges of having an open source development when your whole project itself is governed uh, potentially by anonymous community members? And can exploits happen more often in DAOs or, uh, or do DAOs make the projects a little bit more secure? I think uh, your membership base, your DAO, yeah, um, you know, really kind of weighs heavy on that. Uh, you know, it can definitely um, help with security if you've got the right kind of group together. Um, because more, I like we kind of touched on earlier, more eyeballs, uh, the better. As something that, you know, 20 people might miss, that, that 21st person um, catches something that, that could be, uh, you know, preventing a, a large exploit later down the road or or uh some kind of detrimental um happenings to the to the code or project overall um so so really kind of like your your DAO membership makeup if i've got a DAO of nft dgens uh, then i'm not going to feel a, as comfortable or secure as opposed to if like i had a DAO of builders and devs and you know uh uh le community leaders um in that sense um uh, because you know, like like we said earlier, for for every uh, you know exploit or or you know potential bad code out there, you've got your white hats, but you've also got your black hats out there. Um, and, and so, really, when you have a doubt, I, I think it also goes back to you know, kind of what's the makeup of it? What what's the, what's your membership like? What what's your group like um, overall? We we know that there's some really great ones out there. Um, you know, MakerDAO be, being one of the, you know, top dogs out there, I think. Um, and, and then you've got your um, not as great ones or or maybe not as established ones that, that don't really have that trust built um, um, necessarily. Hello, can I jump in? Sure thing, Sleazy. I Hello, I'm Sleazy, I'm not a Portugal representative, I'm just a community member. So I was thinking about this anonymity aspect. I feel like it's been kind of vilified in the uh, media lately. Well, not lately, in the last uh, quite a few years, 
but it's not as something that uh, we would normally think in the Web3 community because uh, we are kind of already used to anonymity. Normally, people would perceive anonymity as somebody who would try to scam people. But uh, we have been in many uh, spaces, in many Discord communities and forums where people that you know are pretty much all anonymous, except maybe for a few which are influencers or actually dox themselves to represent the project. Uh, I remember this saying, give a man a mask and he will reveal his true self. And that is kind of uh, where it's going. You can perceive it as someone who would be a bad person on the inside, but you can also perceive it as someone who would actually have the liberty to express uh, his true uh, feelings and ambitions. And uh, at the same time, it's not as anonymous because when you are anonymous, but you always keep using the same name, you kind of build a reputation around your name, even though it's not your physical name, let's say, of your physical person. Because especially in DAOs, uh, you have money involved in building your reputation. When you are trying to make a decision, you would try to influence other people using the reputation that you've built with them. So yeah, I feel like anonymity is not as big of a deal and maybe it could even be better, especially because you are, you are in the DAO with people who are like-minded uh, as you, while in Web2, you would usually go with people who are just uh, who are just corporate people that you would normally not try to even be friends with because that's uh, in some uh, corporate sharks. Uh, that's how it works. But yeah, that's my idea here. Can, can I just jump in there and answer to Sleazy something? Um, I, I think it's some very valid points there, and, and I like your quote. Um, because essentially that's what it is. But in that process, a lot of casualties can happen. So in my experience, I don't get invited to down parties. If I say I'm in compliance, the, the door shut. <laughs> so, um, and if I'm going to be really bold, lots of deep, heavy fraud and money laundering as going through DAOs. So it does come with that double-edged sword, right? There's some really good stuff out there. There's some really bad stuff out there. There's really bad stuff happening in the banks that are fully regulated and then fully controlled. And there's really bad stuff. And, you know, so either way we go, wherever we go, we're going to find this intention. What's your intention, good or bad? But I'm just wondering how quick it takes to actually disclose that. How long does it take to find that, ah, this guy was a bad actor. He had bad money. We all bought into this. And the trap door has been opened. So I would try and reduce as many casualties as possible in the process of it actually happening in the first place. But it seems like we need to learn. We need to, we need to get burnt and then we realize how, how hot it is. But um, sorry to be pessimistic or party pooper, but yeah. Every party's got to have a pooper. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I get my coat. I got a taxi boat. <laughs> No, no, I, I think it's good that you come at it from that perspective as well, because, you know, those, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, there, there's going to be fraud, there's going to be um, exploit, there's going to be bad actors uh, in, in every, every project, good and bad. It's, it's the standards, it's the protocols that you have, the guardrails that you have set in place to protect your, your community, protect your IP, um, protect your name and in essence as well. Um, you know, and I, I would like to generally think that uh, out of the majority of p humans on this earth, majority of us all have good intentions um, especially when it comes to community projects that we are passionate about and, and getting behind that we can, um, that we can move things for the better cause. I mean, that's why we join, um, you know, specific groups. That's why we, um, you know, apply ourselves to certain brands because we resonate with the lifestyle that they, they, uh, kind of promote, um, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I, I, I definitely agree that there, there's always going to be that out there, but uh, that kind of leads me into another question I wanted to talk about is this, you know, in coming from a, a, a SaaS world background, a software background in UI UX design, you know, I've, I've had my opportunity to work to work with quite a few different giant companies. And, um, you know, many of these have had open source, um, uh, kind of uh, 
communities as well to, to basically help them improve the community as they say it. But, uh, a lot of times those are just big companies uh, profiting heavily from commu- free community labor. Do we see that that could potentially that same mentality spill over into projects into Web3? Or is it a different type of narrative? Is it a different type of uh, reward system for those that are being um, offering up their time, their knowledge and expertise to uh, be part of the community? Well, for projects, I think that a lot of them hope that they offer it up for free because uh, that that would be great. But um, I, I think a lot of uh, you know DAOs and and projects themselves uh, typically have you know bounties or rewards or some kind of token payout or whatever that may be for various uh, you know contributions to to code to uh, vulnerabilities to to those kind of things. Um, if I'm understanding the question, I'm sorry, I had a phone call come in right at the beginning of the question. Yeah, I just had a phone call come in as well. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, uh, yeah, the, you know, the basic question is, is like, obviously in Web3, there's a lot of payment structure that needs to be put into place, bounties, that kind of thing. And so, the question is: Is do you, do you think we would ever see community members just coming over out and and kind of jumping into the open source community and to help improve it out of the kindness of their hearts, or do are we going to have to pay to get it to people involved? I, I think that might depend on the size of their bag. <laughs> in a lot of situations, you know, if I'm a huge holder in a particular project, then um, yes, I'm going to contribute everything I can for for anything that I think could make price go up. Uh, but uh, I, I think overall, you know, it, you know, the reward incentive, the reward structure, and in Web three, it's you know, it, it's such a unique opportunity with uh, the tokens and things of the sort. Uh, that, that you have tokens or airdrops or NFTs or accesses or whatever it may be that you can reward community with um, for their contributions. Uh, we're in a real unique position with that, I, I think, from more traditional industry uh, in that way. Uh, yeah, so I would also say that there are not really enough engineers in Web3 space. So for them to do the job for free, the only reason why I would see they would do that is if they actually want to get a job by building a reputation by contributing to open source, pretty much. I think Kevin was like, mute, unmute, mute, unmute. Kevin, I know you had something to say. You go ahead, please. Oh, yeah, I was I was just thinking about we're sitting here i have some problems with the sound here and i was just th- thinking about the fact that <clears throat> x should really go open the uh, source and get those uh, load balancer issues uh, solved so that was kind of my i was laughing a little bit about it i think really there's big problems in 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 x's uh, connection so uh sometimes we simply fall out from the from the sound from the from the app here but that being said um uh, a little comment from my but i don't know if you are you guys feel sometimes you drop out from the from the app every day it seems like we fall out from the app so you're definitely not the only one uh elon no. definitely <laughs> if he's listening in um definitely needs to I mean, improve the experience on on x spaces for sure 100 percent um but yeah you're not he alone be there capable my friend of doing it yeah he should be capable of doing it with all the amazing things he he's doing so yeah he might that, give us the same answer as he gave to disney <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe maybe if the code was public 
we could have found someone, not not me definitely, but someone could have found the problem. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, one last call for, for anybody that wants to ask a question to our panelists, uh, please drop them in the comment threads below. Um, we'll, uh, Sam, if you wanna go through and start looking for a couple of those, uh, I'll turn the mic over to you here in just a minute. But uh, you know, I, I do wanna kind of emphasize one thing um, that uh, you know, our founder, Kevin, he, he is, uh, I do have to say that he's definitely got a mindset out there for uh, developers who want to develop their skills in Web3, um, those that want to kind of make that transition from Web2 to Web3. And really, I mean, to be honest, you know, Web3 is definitely a, a wild, wild west. It's anybody's show at this point. And uh it's just prime for for opportunity for for anybody, not just coders, but uh, you know, um, marketers and and uh, influencers and things like that to get involved in it. And one of the things that I I love the approach that he's really starting to try to take is is um, encouraging developers to come in and develop um, you know specific components that can be leveraged by by other people, right? And, uh, and in a way that they can actually be rewarded for their efforts as well. Um, so think of like, uh, you know, NFT uh, royalties that, that an artist can get. Um, you know, a coder is an artist in a different form and in a different medium. And some of the contracts that they can write, some of the code that they can do is definitely, in my opinion, a form of art. And because uh, there's some pretty amazing coders out there, and why why shouldn't they not get um, you know rewarded as well, uh, especially the the good actors we'll call them uh, that are out there really to to try to enhance uh, certain things, and you know a, a, as as many of us are are trying to build out projects, if there's a if there was a marketplace which L1X is definitely working towards for. Uh, projects to kind of tap into a library of different components it's it would make life easier uh, knowing that some of these things have already been vetted um, if you're not very knowledgeable in creating like a, a payment gateway for fiat to crypto or vice versa that you know that one's already been built by a specific developer um, that has been proven or by a different project right and so that's where I feel like open source can really become a powerful tool uh, for for people with inside of crypto, but it also can can have its um, its its moments as well um, because I feel like not every if you take the code of L1X for an example, there I I can't remember how many lines of code Kevin mentioned uh, that he he and his developer team has have developed, but it's in tens of hundreds of thousands of lines of code, right? And so, you know, with that being said, I don't feel like in, in that every project needs to see 100% of the code. I think it was you, Travis, that mentioned that earlier, is, is that not everybody has to see the whole entire thing of code. They just need the, the specific components um, that allow them to basically build uh, what they need to, to do, right? And this is the same in web three as it is in web two and uh it's it it all boils down to that and so you know for for me oftentimes when i hear people stating that they need all of the code sometimes it raises a lot of question in my mind as to why they want that um are they trying to look for specific things uh so that they can grab ip are they looking for specific things so that they can um you know uh kind of build things out uh maybe fork it um you know that type of thing and so that kind of leads me to my final question of of where where we go before we turn it over to the to the uh um, community questions but you know as we write this code um we we all know that code is definitely going to become the the future um the rules of of future economies within web3 and, uh, you know, many people need to become very fluent in that language. So my question to you is, is, 
um, by opening, you know, open, if, if open source becomes that powerful equalizer, will knowledge, not financial, create a new um, divide among us as people? I think it could definitely, um, you know, create that divide in some ways. And, and from those who are skilled enough to understand it or, or play with it or um, enhance or build off it versus those of us who aren't, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, code being, being you know, Web3 is going to be a major financial driver. And if I can get an advantage, um, whether that be, you know, front running a transaction, whether that be, uh, you know, getting in earlier than, than the next person, being able to submit a transaction faster somehow, um, however that may be, it, it'll definitely give me an advantage. Um, but we see those same advantages in every industry, um, you know, there's definitely a divide, you know, even with, with traditional stocks and such, um, from, you know, the, the wall street guys to, you know, the potatoes like myself, uh, I, I don't have the same access to the same information to the same strategies or, or even the same processes, uh, that may streamline different things in different ways. If, if me and, uh, you know, Warren Buffett are both going for, for the same stock. He's going to get in there at a better price than I am. Um, and he's going to get out at a better price than I am. And, and that's just the reality to it. But, um, you know, as we move more and more into a digital infrastructure age, I think uh, just like, you know, smartphones to our to our grandparents or our great-grandparents were, were foreign and unknown and we can probably navigate – them much better than they can and, and take advantage of several different things that they may not be able to. Um, I, I hope our education systems and, you know, our next generations and stuff, um, things like code or at least basic understandings of them become more common knowledge. Um, you know, at, at least I hope so, because when, when I look at it, I see like foreign hieroglyphics um, and I, you know, would, would dream of a world where my kids and their kids and everyone else can at least at the bare minimum get a basic understanding of, of what, you know, someone's looking at um, and that because of how our society is moving and, and how, you know, digital infrastructure is becoming so much more vital to, to everyday life. Yeah, I also have a quick take on this. Uh, I feel like the knowledge divide is only going to get, uh, it's going to shrink rather than increase. Because when you think about the projects, uh, they are really making the effort to make the white paper as simple to read as possible. Uh, anyone pretty much could do it, so maybe it's a with a few exceptions uh, that are maybe overly technical. But if you look at the traditional structure, uh, the higher up you go, the more difficult it becomes to read it. Like, there is no way I would understand anything that's a uh, legal document. And uh, if you are presented a, a plan, like in a corporate, which is like 500 pages long, uh, they obviously make it specifically so that people would not read it. Like, I remember something like uh, the Constitution of America was like on two, three pages long. Like, the entirety of it was just this short. Uh, so... Yeah, I feel like in Web2, it's done specifically, they are not transparent. And if it is transparent, they bloat it specifically so people would not read it, while in the Web3, uh, it goes the other way to make it as accessible as possible. And then there are people like me who are trying to break out and do Web3 by actually reading information and making it simpler. <laughs> if you read some of my uh, recent tweets, but yeah, that's enough shilling. Thank you. I love your stuff, Sleazy. Keep it coming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why I was open to follow after you, Sleazy, because you're you're able to correlate that so well, and um, you you can almost I almost think oh, did he write that for me? Because I can think it, but I can't always say it, and you can just deliver it so well. So I appreciate it. Um, but you're right; these white papers need to be understandable now for uh, crypto industry for the regulator. So they need to understand how you're doing it, where you're doing it, how do you make your money, where's the security. Where's your data? Blah, blah, blah. Where's your liquidity? What's your exit plans? They want all this information now, but it can't be a 500 page document. You're right. So, um, but I think going back to the question uh, to add, hopefully to add something, um, I think there's this consistent thing with transparency versus 
and amenity. And I get both. If I was extremely wealthy, I'm not. But if I was, I may want, maybe not want all my data out there on the uh, internet for people to use and abuse. So yeah, I get the anonymity, but also then you're going into business with someone, they want transparency. So I think essentially, you know, if we are looking for, I'm looking for enough information to get satisfied within my knowledge and skill set, but I'm looking for red flags. So like you mentioned, if someone is asking for the data they don't really need, you need to know that, right? And that's a red flag. So you choose who you're going to do business with. I think we're all over 21 now, I think. I am for sure, probably double that and more. So I think the risk management is the key thing with all of this. If we're going into a high risk environment, which we clearly are in, we can look at the stocks, but it's a different world. We're in a high risk environment, right? And we sort of like that. And then we're asking for some security, hard, really difficult to get the two together. So really good risk management skills, I think is applied at every level from an investor, developer, retailer, um, every every aspect of it. Um, so yeah, thanks. No, that was that was some great insight. So um, we have uh, a couple of community questions, but they're geared more towards uh, Layer One X. So I'll just kind of spin them. Uh, many of them are just asking how we are planning on. Um, protecting our ip but i'll flip that over to you guys how 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 would you protect your ip while becoming open source decentralized versus uh kind of keeping things centralized within your own projects or what have you seen yeah i think it goes a lot back to what we talked about earlier where like you can you can open source code, but that doesn't mean you have to open source, you know, all of your code or, or everything, just the pertinent things. So, you know, things that people would need to build on layer one X or, uh, you know, that they would need to tap into or utilize, uh, to, to really be successful. Um, you know, you know, launching and, and operating there, um, is really kind of the most important stuff. Uh, all, all the other, you know, code and stuff like that, that's not as pertinent isn't, uh necessary to open source and a lot of that really has the bread and the butter in it um you know creating a smart contract and stuff like that or you know tweaking some kind of uh code to, to make some kind of you know more highly optimized contract and, and things of the sort is great but it'll only take you so far it's not a product um and, and really the the combination of everything is your product um and, and you can you know from you can still have IP protection while open sourcing the, those critical points. Um, you know, if I go and fork your code, I'm going to have a small, small part of your overall experience of your overall product. Um, and, and I'm not going to have anything that, you know, I, I can market or expand like you guys could. Um, I don't have the plans. I don't have the foresight. And, and I've got a whole lot of other pieces I've got to create around it. So, you know, I, I know there's a lot of fear around the whole open source and your code. Oh, my gosh, everyone's going to come. They're all going to rip it off. There's going to be a 100 of me. Um, but but I don't think that's, you know, necessarily always the case. There may be a 100 components uh, uh, of things that you guys are doing out there, but it doesn't mean that it's a uh, hundred products. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, it's interesting um, being in the U.S. The U.S. patent laws uh, are just nuts, especially when it comes to uh, trying to patent software. Um, a lot of VC companies actually view them as liabilities on the books for for a lot of their investments. And so, you know, I don't know how it is in other countries, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of uh, big tech companies here in the U.S. keep it all inside of their what they call the black box um, that only a few people know the what's inside of that black box. And they do that for a reason. Um, to try to help protect their their IP. Um, so I definitely agree with you on that one, Travis. So um, yeah, uh, we're, we're coming up on the hour. So uh, let's take just 30 seconds. So we appreciate all of our panelists being with us today. Um, great insight, great um, expertise being shared around the open source uh, tech talk. 
uh, I think we've given our listeners some some things to definitely think about. So on your way out, uh, if you want to just answer, you know, for those that are non-coder type people, uh, what kind of advice would you give them when they're evaluating different projects and things like that uh, to help protect themselves from, you know, potential exploits or, you know, um, you know, things like that. Uh, and then just go ahead and, and tell people how they can find out more about you and your projects. Yeah, for me in particular, um, because like I said, I am a complete potato when it comes to, um, a lot of that stuff and, and reading code and everything else, uh, that, that is not me by any means, but, uh, some, some of the things I do is one, what is the other community like? You know, are there trusted? You or, or are there people that you at least put some trust into in there? Um, whether it be other builders in the space, other developers in the space, whatever that may be, that that the people that have that knowledge that you don't, um, and, and really kind of understanding the the project, the vision, the overall goal, and, and does it seem like it's something that's even possible or attainable? Uh, so, something that, that, that can really work, um, because a lot of that can really tell you a lot of the ethos of the team, you know, if they're making these outlandish statements and, and you know, outlandish goals they're putting out there of what they're going to do, uh, then it may be, Hey, we're just trying to soak up some liquidity and things of the such. And it may be something you need to look into a little bit more. Uh, but, but really having those kind of trusted sources for me, um, even if it's someone I don't personally know, but I, I know their involvement in the space, um, or, or in other projects or whatever that may be kind of adds a layer of trust, uh, for myself when, when looking at some of those things. So that's kind of my take from, from someone who has no idea what they're looking at when they look at any kind of code. Hemobot, you want to go? Maybe we try Olivia. I don't know. I have very, very little hope. Still bridging. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Pending you... approval. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we'll give it up uh, one last call out for uh, Amelbot or Olivia to kind of jump in and say their 30 second outro. Last call. <laughs> no, <not. laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, appreciate my co-hosts uh, Sam and and uh, Anna for for putting these together along with uh, our other partners, uh, ex co-host as well. Um, these topics are always uh, fun to do. Kind of, a, we try to always do off off the beaten path of topics that are shared across multiple different. Uh, uh, AMAs and so uh, try to come at it from different perspectives as well. So we appreciate our panelists. We appreciate you guys for listening in. Um, if you can, uh, our next AMA, please mark your calendars for the 15th of April at, I believe it's 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for episode number 40. Uh, this one should be a really good one because it's all about burning crypto bridges. Um, we're going to be talking about the uh, need for, for bridges in the future, uh, if we're even going to need them, um, and kind of dive into some of the upcoming technology. Oh, oh you, do we have Animal yeah. Bot back? You've just, got my, you've just got my attention. I'll see you on that call. Thanks. Yeah, I'll send <laughs> you the invite. I'll definitely, I, I'll definitely will. And also we have a couple of more upcoming um, topics that are super cool, like um, – Cody suggested we do one on community FUD, uh, so and and how it could potentially actually you know um, sustain the whole community system you know so that that one will be very interesting as well so yeah we have a few of them lined up and um, uh, if you guys keep an eye on uh, X Talks uh, handle you will see 
uh, all spaces announced and please please feel free to always um poke me and say hey i just want to step in and you be my guest yep uh definitely uh follow the x talks handle that would be great uh, so thanks again for our panelists, uh, Sleazy, my man, thanks for coming up and, uh, representing the community. Uh, great insights as, as always keep those, uh, uh, very concise, uh, explanation, <laughs> uh, diagrams, uh, infographics, we'll call them coming. They're uh, very helpful for the community. So we appreciate it. So other than that, uh, we will talk to you guys later. Keep innovating, keep uniting all of crypto, and we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Ciao.